Six in the morning. We jump in our beds. Terrible sounds. Red alert, red alert, red alert. Just like that, again and again and again, without stopping. Boom, 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 boom. It just continued like that. I open my messages and I see countless messages of people asking for help. That terrorists are trying to infiltrate. They are shooting in the house, unlocking rooms, trying to break into homes. We have a security camera at home. We see them on the phone. He looks and says, they're coming in. We look and we can see the terrorists breaking in through the window. We can also hear their noises. This is it. They have entered our house. As we've been picking up the pieces of this terrible attack, we have heard of Katya and her family. A story of faith and hope in a hopeless situation. We're right here at the entrance of Nachal Oz, the very village right at the border of the Gaza Strip where Katya and her family lived. That fateful morning, with the news pouring in, many believers in Israel received and shared an urgent prayer request from this family, trapped in their shelter, in their own home, with terrorists in their house. Hundreds joined in prayer for this family's rescue, and God answered with a supernatural deliverance. But what gives a family the courage to face terror, all too common to the Gaza surrounding communities? How did she find faith under fire? We arrived as two new immigrant families. We began studying Hebrew. Dima started working at the cow shed. This is how our lives began. Studying and working a little. It was very difficult to come to such a small kibbutz without the language too. The first steps were not easy. Two weeks after we arrived, the first mortar fell on the kibbutz. That was actually the beginning of the intifada. Tanks and gunfire. That was the first shock I got when I suddenly understood where I was. My first question to God was, why, why am I here? What have I done to you? Why did you bring me to this place? And many people began calling us and saying, why did you go there? Get out of there, it's a very dangerous place. Actually, it was my husband who said, no, we came here and we're staying here. Only after some time, I understood that God wants us there. He chose a place for us that we would be on the border of Gaza, that we would be like watchmen of the borders. All these years, we went through a lot. We had mortars, mortar bombs, Qassam rockets. They started fires in our fields. There were terrorists that tried entering through the tunnels. I think the most difficult operation was in 2014, which created a huge crisis in the kibbutz. One day in August, which was actually during a ceasefire, a mortar fell next to a house. One family with small children didn't get to their safe room in time, and the small child was killed by shrapnel that penetrated the door. Many families decided to leave. Also us, I said, Lord, enough, I do not want to continue on there. I can't, I did the work for you, I was there, I was faithful. And we began looking for other places to move to. But at the same time that we were looking for a place, I was, I would stand and just cry, please don't let me make a mistake, don't let me make a choice out of fear. And I know that I had fear. God closed the door. And suddenly God really did this huge miracle. He brought us so many people that would visit us daily. It gave us hope, it gave us light, it healed our hearts. It gave us joy to return and it gave us strength to continue on. Later, he also gave us another miracle. We bought our own home. So now we have a country, we have a home, and we are connected to this place. We love this place, we want to raise our children there. Yes, they went through traumas and difficulties, but they still chose to stay on the kibbutz with us. It was the day before, Friday. Friday, the entire kibbutz is hanging out in the pool and on the stage. We are preparing for a celebration of 70 years on the kibbutz. There's never been an event planned as large as this at the kibbutz. 
I am also terribly excited that after the celebration, I really wanted to stay for the celebration and my husband really wanted to fly, but I said, no, 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 we will fly after the celebration. We aren't flying beforehand because I'm not missing the celebration. So that evening I thought maybe I'll start preparing my things, that way they'll be ready. So I gathered clothing and other stuff, I grabbed my suitcase and my clothes and put them inside the safe room. We went to sleep with such excitement for tomorrow, six in the morning. We jump up in our beds from the terrible sound. It's from within our sleep, the first minute, I don't understand. What is it? Terrible sounds, red alert, red alert, red alert. Just like that, without cease, without cease, without cease. Boom, 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 boom. I sort of crawl from the bed to the floor. I say, Dima, please close the window, close the window. Wait, wait, I can't get up. He was afraid to get closer because if it falls nearby, the shrapnel can fly. After a few minutes, when it stops for a second, we jump up quickly, close the windows and run to the second safe room. We have two. One on the right side of the house and one on the other side of the house. We run towards our son into his room and lock the iron locks. At the same time, as we're standing there next to the room, we're already hearing gunshots. What are these gunshots? Is it inside the kibbutz? Not on the kibbutz? We're just kind of there wondering and my son says, okay, whatever it is, I'm closing the door and going back to sleep. We go back to our room and after a few minutes, we understand that there is an infiltration. There's an infiltration, not just of one or two terrorists, but of multiple terrorists. At that time, we still didn't know that it was about 150, roughly. I sit down, look at my phone, and I understand that something terrible is happening. Not just rockets, not just mortar bombs falling on the whole country. There was also a terrorist infiltration on the entire border with Gaza. What do we do? What is the first thing every believer is supposed to do? We lift our hands. Abba, what is happening? Bless us, bless our nation, bless our army, you know what is going on. And I ask from God that he would hide us, that he would confuse the terrorists so they can't carry out their plans, that he would destroy their plans. So I continue like that in prayer. After that, I felt that God did something special with me. Suddenly I felt that I am on duty in the army and now I need to turn off all my emotions. I don't feel, I need to function. I need to be, to be strong. And he surrounded me with his presence. That's how I continued on. I opened my messages and see countless messages of people asking for help. That terrorists are trying to infiltrate homes. That they are shooting at houses. They are unlocking rooms, trying to break into homes. People are screaming for help and constantly asking, where is the army? Where is the army? Where is the army? At the same time, I received a message from my son, Danny, who was in the area of the Nova party. He wasn't inside the party, but he was in the area. What to do? I'm on duty, so I know what to do. I sent angels there. Please, angels, go there and take him to a safe place. Please cover him that he would be hidden. And I just don't feel fear. That was an absolute miracle for me. We couldn't report in our apps that usually work. It's an app that they gave us for emergencies. It did not work. Telephones didn't work. There was hardly internet. Whoever had a router in their safe room had internet. So Danny with his three friends were there, many terrorists there, and my son in the other safe room can't come to me because we're all afraid to leave. We understand that they simply took over the kibbutz. At that time, people start sending me messages, so I tell them, please pray, there are terrorists here. After we had already left and a few days went by, I saw just how many people this message has reached. The spiritual army of the Lord, my big family here in the land and all around the world, they just got up and began to war. That's his army. And the Lord told me later on, to all my children, I am drafting them into my army. There is no more time to sleep. You need to take up your weapon and fight over Israel, over my nation. You all need to fight. You need to stay alert. We are very much in the end times. We are in very special days. He wants to awaken his people throughout the entire world. At 11 in the morning, we see on our camera 
We have a security camera outside, which we can watch from our room. He looks and says, they're coming in. I move to the floor, I sit in the corner next to the closet, and I say quietly, please pray, the terrorists are inside our homes. I've lived there 22 years, and from my experience, if there is a single terrorist or even a dog gets close to the fence, by 10 minutes there will be soldiers everywhere. They'd have stopped them, helicopters in the air. But there's not, there's nothing, I don't know. It's just completely out of the norm. So I write, let's pray, let's repent, because again, it's very important to pray and to ask for forgiveness. And if something happens now, you will know for certain that we will meet in heaven. Because if we're with him, if we're in faith, not alive or not death, we'll be with him. We'll always be with him. And I see that my children starting to write. My eldest son is located in a different house. He writes, Mom, I love you, Dad, we love you both. And Yoni says, Mom, what are we going to do? I said, everything is okay. God is with us. And he continues to write, please be with me, be in touch with me. I said, everything is okay, breathe. I see them and I sort of feel them getting closer to the door and for a moment I felt okay this is it they're going to enter break through the door and they're going to shoot us so I thought okay they'll shoot and then we'll go straight to heaven for just a moment I felt the moment of leaving this world but the other part of me felt how can this be you are his daughter a daughter of God all these years he told me you stay here you be faithful and I will be faithful. All these words, all his promises that he gave through his word, what is written in the Bible, it's not just words. It's not a book that you can read and just forget. This book is one that we take, we eat it, and the words become flesh, something strong, something that works, something that's active. I simply declare his words. I said all of these things and I felt it working. According to my dear husband's face, I saw that something really terrible is happening. Because for me, I can feel but also can't feel anything. He is sitting next to me and he is just in a state in my life, in our 30 years together. I've never seen him like that. They're approaching. We hear them coming towards our room. We can hear them, but they don't touch the door. We wait for them to start to try to open the door and silence nothing happens exactly a half hour ago i get a message from my neighbor that lives next door they're trying to get into my safe room she keeps sending these messages and many people sent messages that they're trying to break into their safe room essentially the safe room is the first place that they try to break into that's what happened in kibbutz Beri and kibbutz kfar aza they would place an explosive charge and simply blow up the doors. They would throw grenades, they would take tires, light them on fire and throw them inside the house. And here they stood, but they never touched the door. We see on the camera that they start going to the other way, towards Yoni's room. I write, Yoni, they're coming towards you, everything is okay, just breathe, God is with you. Don't move, don't do anything. Mom, what should I do? Should I... Don't do anything. They start opening the doors. They open doors of room on the way. Closets, everything. They approach his door, stand there, but they do not touch the door. What is this? What is this? Only after we had already left and some time had passed, I kept going over and over it and saying to myself, what was that? And I saw how they came right up to the door and it's like they didn't see it. They saw a white wall there, but didn't see the door. God's presence was so strong, the fear of God, I think it just so completely engulfed them that they didn't succeed, they didn't manage to do anything. Also later when we reviewed what they did in the camera footage, they were in our house, they were sitting there on the couch, they were going around, but it's like they were disoriented. Even when they left, they forgot their bullets. The entire case of bullets they forgot on our table. I thought, wow.
Only at 2 p.m. the first soldiers arrived, they entered our home and suddenly we hear Hebrew. Wow, what a great joy it was. First they scanned the house and only afterwards they allowed us to go outside a little. We requested help from them to get our son out of his room. It was difficult for him to open the door so hard, he was so afraid. When he finally opened it, he saw all the blood on the floor, he thought something had happened to one of us, so he ran and just... <laughs> we had such an incredibly long, deep and strong hug, I've never had such a hug in my life. When he came to our room, we saw... He opened up his Facebook and saw that two of our families the terrorists had taken them, broken into their phones and were doing a live stream, filming them. These were dear families that were right next to us, just three rows away. I thought, no, I don't believe it, this can't be, but it was so. Later we learned that an entire family was murdered, a few others they kidnapped. By 9 or 10 in the evening, the evacuation operation began of all the kibbutzes. That was also an extremely difficult operation. They opened up homes and evacuated people from their safe rooms. They gave them a few minutes to gather their most important belongings. Most of the families left without clothes, without anything. I left with my suitcase, because God took care that I would put everything inside the safe room. Also with this, I'm just... I laughed a little and thought, wow, even in this thing you cared for me. <laughs> Everyone came out with plastic bags and we came out with two suitcases. The truth is that time stopped for me that day. On the 7th of October, from that forward, I never know what day, what hour, what month is it. It's like everything stopped. I haven't been here since the 7th of October. How much time has passed? A month and a half? I'm so excited to see my house and the area. Now they've opened up the possibility to come home, visit and take a few things. So I want to use this opportunity because I don't know what will happen on Sunday after the ceasefire ends. None of us knows when we are going to return. Do we have a home or not? Our kibbutz was supposed to be celebrating 70 years exactly on the same Shabbat that everything happened. Wow, look how many tanks. This is the parking place where our car was always parked. Wow. <laughs> Who's there? Here's the cat. You see, it's still Sukkot because we had put up the Sukkah, the Sukkahs. How do I get into the house? Hello, this is my husband Dima. We are now going to try to enter our home to see what's the situation. All my flowers, I just <laughs> bought them right before that Shabbat. I went and bought new baskets and new flowers. Now we're entering the living room. I no longer recognize my house. This is my favorite couch. See what they did? The terrorists sat here and there was blood. The living room was full of blood. They came in through the window over there. I'll give you a video of it later. Wow, everything looks so terrible. Oh, Stefajka, hello, my dear kitty, my sweetie. Dima, where is her food? What a smell! They came in here, they cut through here, there was a lot of glass here, I'm not certain, but it could be that they were injured. There was blood all over the house from here to there. They didn't clean here. All this gross blood is still left here. He was sitting here in the room. We began to hear gunfire from the Kalachnikovs. So he said to me, Mom, I'm staying here. So he stayed here. He was in the safe room and we were in the safe room over there. 
when we understood that there were many terrorists in the kibbutz, we couldn't leave the room because we didn't know if there was someone here or not. It was very dangerous to leave. Suddenly it's a very cold house. It's not your own anymore. It's my house, but it's not my house. That's us, the whole family in 2015. Me, Dima, Daniel, Yoni and Nikita. Now I think, what if we don't come back? What will we do? What will happen? What's the future? This is the place that we were supposed to be. We came here to pray here, to watch over this area, to be on the border, to tell people what happens here, to be like a house of prayer, which also sanctifies this place. <laughs> and suddenly you're thinking, my neighbors said, no, we can't come back. This guy also said, we can't come back, we don't know what to do. So you say to yourself, how will you go back? When will you go back? Far Aza and Be'eri are completely broken. They're not going to allow us to return beforehand. So we just don't know. We're really in an uncertain situation. So now we just need to build some sort of temporary life from what remains. We would always sit here, look, here's our Bible. We would sit and read and pray together. Everything is so full of dust. Our neighbor, the whole family, was murdered. The whole family, her, her husband, and two girls were murdered. Also, on the same day, the terrorists came to his father's house, which is over there at the other end of the kibbutz, and they murdered him too. The entire family. Your mind just doesn't comprehend that this is reality that everything happened this way. In one second, our entire lives turned upside down in such a drastic way that you just can't grasp it. See what we did here? At the end, when we were able to leave the room, when the soldiers arrived, I asked my husband to remove the door handle just in case. What did they do in Be'eri and Kfar Aza? They would put something here and explode the doors. Here is where we spent almost 24 hours. It's hard. That's how you close it and that's it. Here we have a small lock that we would use to close ourselves in. Here I sat in my pajamas, in this corner, like this, on the floor, I think for two hours. I couldn't move with my phone. We were getting the messages. When I understood that the terrorists were in our home, I said to my child, to Yoni, please just don't move. And he writes back, Mom, what do I do? There's nothing to do. Breathe. I was also afraid. I sat here and I think. I see them on the security camera on Dima's phone. And I think, <laughs> this is it? Okay, fine, now they're going to come in, kill us, and we'll go to heaven. I say to the kids, come, let's pray together. Even if something happens, we'll meet in heaven. Every second there's a new message. They're in our house, they broke the window, they're shooting at our room, they're shooting the house. And I understood that's it. They took over the kibbutz. There is no help I can wait for except from our great Lord that is able to do miracles and wonders. There is no one here for me, no soldiers, no one. So I sent the message that there are terrorists in the house. At the same time, my son who was in the area of the Nova party, he was there crying. I'm here. My eldest son with a small child is at a different home where there is also shooting. I see the messages that they're shooting outside his house. We have one mother in one house and my mother in the other house. I just don't know what will be. I know it's all by his miracle alone. <laughs> That's what he told us when we came to this place, that we will see and we will hear, but they will not touch us. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon the soldiers arrived, so we got up and left from here. It seems that this presence, the presence of God was so strong both here in our home, in our kibbutz, that they were filled with some sort of fear. They did do terrible things, but not like they did in other kibbutzes. They came right up the door here, right up to the entrance. 
a drop of blood, here was a drop of his blood. Both here and outside the other room we were just in. We're sitting here and watching them approach this door in the camera. They stand here, drops of blood fall, and they do not touch the door. Over here, here a mortar fell. That same night when they evacuated, what they did, what the army did, they went inside each house, one at a time. The jeep would come to each house and take the family inside the jeep. They gave you five minutes, whatever you could take in that time, you took. Everyone came out with some kind of small bag, then they brought us over here. It was at night, dark, mortar bombs are falling, red alerts, terrible sounds, chaos. We were standing here. There's a very small safe room here. Around the corner are soldiers guarding us because there are still terrorists on the kibbutz. This part was closed and the soldiers were here. So they evacuated us from this side because the gate close to the border with Gaza was filled with terrorists. What they did in other kibbutzes, they took the keys, unlock the cars, take the spare tires, light them on fire and throw them into homes. So people would just choke and run outside. That's how they did it in so many houses, but here they did not. They didn't even throw grenades. Afterwards, strangely, they told us that there were loads of grenades, RPGs and weapons here. They just didn't use them. They didn't succeed. How can you explain this? There was a great miracle here. This is the visitor center where I worked. Let's go inside and see. That's the new pergola they built a week before everything happened. Wow, it's open. Wow. Want to see a video about the kibbutz? So here people would come and we would present a video for them. Wait. Ah, it works. <laughs> Hold on, look. Come summertime, everyone knows that I'm the first to enter the pool on the day it opens and the last to leave on the day it closes with tears. This is my favorite place, it's a place that calms me. I come to swim a little, pray a little and just... I don't know, it's this kind of magical, beautiful place. My son worked here as a lifeguard for two or three years. Here, they told me a kassam fell here, what a shame. How I love this place, I really love it. I really miss it. This place. I feel pretty safe here. My only concern is for my family. You can renovate them, you can build them anew. You can change things inside, like that. To do general renovation, to change it completely. That's what my wife said, that we need to repaint the walls, at least in the safe room, so it won't remind her of this day. We all forget things, but a day like this, is impossible to forget. The hardest questions that people really love to ask now are What's next? Will you go back? And how are you? These are the hardest questions. How are you? Great, fine, we are alive. But you can't say that it's okay. Look what is happening. It's not over. How many people are suffering? How many people lost their loved ones? How many people are still there in Gaza? And what will happen with them? 
How is it possible to say everything's fine? So it's a very hard question. I decided that for me, I'm not answering this question now. How will I go back and to where will I go? I know it really hurts me to see all the people that are trying every day to get an answer to this question, what are we going to do? The families with children that simply don't know. They built their homes there, they took mortgages and built their futures, they sow their futures in Nachal Oz. This question is so very difficult, what will happen? To build your life over again in a place that's essentially destroyed? How can you, next to you is your friend's house and now the entire family is gone? I decided to do this, I'll live each day, I'll do what he wants. A week after we left the kibbutz, he told me, I want you to go and speak. Go and tell the story. About something like this, you cannot be silent. You can't not react now. The world needs to know. People need to know what happened. So I say it like this. I have a day. Thank you. I'll do what you want. I'll be where you want me to be. We can kind of feel like his disciples. They have no home. They have no work. But they go each day to the place that God wants them to go, so we go, we are given a place to live, something to eat, something to wear. He provides everything, he cares for every little thing. It will be hard for me, but if he tells me to go back, I'm going back. It's hard for me to think about going back there, and it's hard for me to think that I'm not going back there. That's it, that's how it ends, but it's not over. That's how something else begins. It's something that will affect so many people for a long time. It's not a simple event at all. It's an event that is supposed to awaken many people. It was a miracle that Katya and her family are with us today to share their testimony of God's miraculous power in the darkest days. As of the making of this film, there are still more than a hundred hostages held in Gaza. And it is our hope and prayer that all of Israel will have their sons, daughters, fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters returned. This conflict is far from over, and the task of rebuilding is great. But as we've seen with Katya's story, we need the prayers and support as the body of Messiah for God's protection and restoration. As Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Katya's resolve and faith under fire is an inspiration to us. And in the days ahead, we need the body of Messiah united in the gospel, standing as one with our people. So I invite you to put your spiritual armor and join us as we stand as one for Israel.